Well, this is such a beautiful campus. I'm going to come back here and bend and go skiing. Yeah. So is there an echo? Is it OK? Nice. A little more up? Can't hear quite. A little more up, I think. Anyway. So I have to say, um, I've only been in Oregon for about 24 hours, but I'm so excited to be here because I first came to, I'm just going to talk until they're ready. I first came to Oregon when I was about 17. I got on a bus in San Francisco, um, and I went, I, I must have stopped in Klamath Falls because I've never seen logs that size. And um, I'm from the east. I grew up in New York. I've just never seen nature this big and just so incredible. And I ended up working on a sheep ranch in Coos Bay, which was a phenomenal experience. And then I ended up working as a tree planter in the Siskiyou um, kind of range, which was a phenomenal experience. And I kind of, I was looking down from the airplane from San Francisco, and I just thought, oh my gosh, all these trees, no wonder I had to write a book about beavers <laughs> one day. <laughs> so some kind of wonderful karma is bringing me back here. And also, this is the first reading from Beaverland since it was published in December, west of the Mississippi. It's the first reading out west. So it's really exciting to me that it's in Oregon. It feels very special. So thank you for having me. I have to thank Roundabout Books when they're done with that. But, <laughs> but I think you're all so lucky to live here. So that's what I have to say. But um, you've come here to you know, hear me talk about beavers, which I'm very excited to do. I put some slides together. I'm going to read a little bit from the book. I'm just curious how many people have actually read Beaverland or have heard about Beaverland and are curious about it. Okay, so so if you haven't read the book, that's fine because I'm going to talk about it and it'll be a great introduction. And are you all kind of know a lot about beavers and love beavers or you're ambivalent about beavers or you're just <laughs> curious about beavers? What, well, you'd be surprised. I mean, back east where I am from, there are a lot of beavers, and there's a lot of um, misinformation about beavers, and there's a lot of historic ambivalence towards beavers because they bring water, which um, I think until recently people have thought we didn't want. And now, after last summer's drought in the east, and um, I live in the corner of Connecticut that's right near Massachusetts, right up abuts it. We had 100 forest fires last summer. In fact, I wrote an opinion piece with Boston Globe saying that the Forest Service should rebrand beavers as Smokey the Beaver <laughs> instead of Smokey the Bear because really we need what beavers are, are, are doing. So we are just waking up in the east to wild, to, we don't call them wildfires because we don't like that, that's too scary. We call them forest fires or brush fires. But it's the same. It's a fire out of control that humans have not planned. So 100 forest fires in Massachusetts in a, when they're normally five, that's a big jump. And we also had tons of rain last summer. And then we had drought. And then we had tons of rain. And then we had drought again. So everybody was like, wait, how come we have drought? We just had all this rain. Well, that's because our river system is not working properly. And that's why we need beavers. So I'm going to so in the East, we're waking up to a lot of the problems that you have been, I think, alert to out here in the West for some time. Um, I just, I was speaking in San Francisco to the Pacific Forest Trust earlier this week, talking to foresters, and it was really interesting, um, you know, the scale at which, especially California, has been dealing with rain and then drought and, and fire, it's starting to feel kind of biblical at scale. Just Really, beavers are such uh, an important resource for watershed resiliency. And it was interesting, I was speaking to 200 people in the forestry industry, and they were just really interested in the role that beavers could play for the forests that they're managing um, for watershed resiliency. So I think we need to think about beavers as millions of highly trained engineers out there in the woods. Maybe parts of the west you need to get them back um, but in the east we have we have a lot of them uh, because we're a lowland woodland area with lots
lost water to date, whereas a lot of places out here, you run out of water, so you need to work to relocate them and restore the habitat so that they can then be self-sufficient. You've, 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 had, you've had some exciting projects out here that I monitor and write about in the book. So. In fact, one of them is not far from here. Maybe you all know about it. And I think the High Desert Museum did an interesting project not too long ago. Has anybody here worked with that? Uh, I just I just saw it. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting display they had in the first. Yeah. They've been doing some really important are work. Are you aware that one of our major universities here, their mascot is beaver? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> because I wanted to research the origin of the beaver believer term. I'm a really intrepid researcher. So then where did this term come from? Nobody seemed to know. It seemed to come out of the atmosphere. And um, it's the OSU sport chant, right? <laughs> beaver believer. So I probably came from, from that. But because uh, that's the kind of code name for people who have been supporting beavers. So are we ready? Just wind me up. I can talk about beavers 
for a long time. Um, so in Beaverland, I wanted to present a deep look at how beavers shaped this country and have really fascinated people since Pliny. And the more I learned about them, the more intrigued I became and the more questions I had. And suddenly, um, six years went by. <laughs> it was a kind of fever dream of interest and research and falling in love with beavers and being really deeply fascinated by them. But before I talk about the book and go into some of the issues I started to, to mention earlier, I just wanted to say a little bit about how it all started. Because I'm not a scientist, I'm not a beaver expert, at least I wasn't before. Um, I grew up on a farm in the Hudson Valley. And one of the great gifts of growing up on a farm is that you're often hot and bored. So we would end up at the pond. And I was really obsessed with trying to make a frog my pet and swim around with it. And I think I learned a lot from water creatures and from that pond, which was this place that I didn't understand but was full of life. And especially creatures like frogs who could be with us for a little while, but then they go into their water world. They just, they really fascinated me. I'm sure I'm not alone. Many kids are fascinated by frogs. And it occurred to me when I was putting this, you know, thoughts together for you today that beavers are sort of like that. Maybe that's part of why they have fascinated people uh, throughout the thousands of years, really, because they're mysterious. We, we don't really understand them, and we can't really follow them. At least we couldn't until 20th century technology and 21st century technology like underwater cameras. But one day, I was walking in the woods with my dog, Coda, and she stopped, froze in her tracks, and next thing I knew, I heard this I thought maybe a gun had gone off, and it was a beaver slamming the water, warning me to go away. And I looked over, and sure enough, what had been previously just a dried out swamp was this growing body of water. And I thought, this is the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. What had been just a nothing burger, a, a, an old dry patch, was this bristling silver sheen of water that had really happened in a week. I had only been away for a week. And that was the beginning. Um, so I just started reading everything I could about beavers and learning about this weird rodent, Castor canadensis. So at this point, I'm going to hand around what was going to be my first slide. Maybe you can just share that around. Um, and I just want to say very quickly, beavers jump-started transatlantic trade because it was lust for their fur, which sent ships sailing across the Atlantic here from Europe. They would then rev up the engines of capitalism in the 19th century. So our first millionaire and multimillionaire, John Jacob Astor, would make his money on beaver fur and then move on to other things. But it wasn't just the first economies of our country that beavers founded. They literally shaped the continent. And when I discovered this, it really um, made me realize that to share the story of beavers, I really needed to share the story of how rivers work. Because that's what beavers have been doing since millennia. In fact, there were big beavers here during the Pleistocene. Maybe some of you know this. There were beavers the size of bears living here with the mammoths and the saber-toothed tigers. Pretty impressive. Um, the Castor canadensis that we have today is not the same species. All the megafauna died out, and uh, later species of beavers evolved. But basically, beavers did a lot of heavy lifting throughout the millennia, shaping the way water moved through the land. Therefore, they shaped the land. Um, so if we imagine back tens of thousands of years, there were 400 million beaver, we estimate, living throughout North America. It truly was a beaver land. Beavers in every watershed, slowing down the water, managing it, so that instead of when rain fell, it rushing through the river system out to the sea, which it does in our time, it could sink in, be cleansed along the way. And the whole river system was like a of arteries and veins that went into the land. And it was all that water 
that led to the great boreal forests and hardwood forests that led to the abundance of wildlife that so stunned the first settlers and explorers that came here. But let's, let's go to Beaverland. I want to read you just the opening passage, and then I'll share with you my next slide. imagined 
uh, realities of the beaver. But um, let's look at some science now, maybe the next slide, at why scientists call them ecosystem engineers. This term um, was given to beavers because they're the only animal apart from man, humankind, I should say, that transforms the environment to meet their needs, which is pretty incredible. This little rodent, not even three feet tall, 50 pounds, four ever-growing orange teeth. Their IEQ, the traditional measure of animal intelligence, is not impressive. But what they can do is very impressive. They are brilliant at building. Um, and so if we look at this slide, um, what, you know, lucky for us, what beavers need to survive is water. We might think of them as water farmers. I think one of the myths about beavers is that they're tree biters, that they eat trees. They actually only use, utilize trees to build um, dams and lodges um, and to make a food cache for the winter. Other than that, they, wanna, they want aquatic vegetation. So they're maybe the world's first hydroponic farmers, not sure. Um, and water is the story of our century. So too much water from flooding one place, too little water in another, fires, drought, raising coastlines from rising seas. And in this story, beavers are in real time right now helping us, even when we don't realize it, and I'll get to that. But throughout the country, an increasing number of programs are harnessing what beavers can do. It's really exciting because we almost wiped beavers out with the fur trade, but smart policies brought them back in the early 1900s, concerted efforts. So we also need to acknowledge that they are one of our greatest conservation success stories. They're one of the really, really stories we can say, hey, we got that right, and we brought them back. Um, so, what's happening in this slide that I wanted to point out to you? Um, the slide, I guess, on your right, is a beaver dam right near my home that I watched beavers making this uh, winter, completely out of season. It's a remarkable story I'm going to touch on a little bit later. In 14 weeks, they had built a dam um, with very little food, very little building material, actually out of four native birch trees. Um, and that dam is now impounding at last me measurement something like nine million gallons of water. Again, in an area that was completely dry. Um, the largest animal construction on Earth is actually a beaver dam. It's in northern Alberta. It's been seen by satellite. So many animals make things. Birds make nests. Octopi make these crazy walled forts. But beavers make constructions that actually prevail. Um, and that's another interesting thing, because we'll talk about that a little bit later. Successive generations of beavers will work on the same dam and lodge complex. But the slide um, to the left is illustrates that when beavers come to a stream or a creek or a small water course, they'll make a dam, swell it out, move down, they'll do it again and again and again. A beaver pond is never a one-off. Um, this means that their dams are incredibly resilient to floods, and in fact, um, biomimicry, the study of nature for engineering design, people are looking at beaver dams and thinking, we could learn something about how to build more res resilient dams from beavers, but also it means that um, the water really gets slowed down, and even if there's a massive storm event, if the first dam is breached, the second dam catches it, and the third, so that the sheer force of that water is dispelled. It's quite brilliant from an engineering perspective. Um, the other thing that I discovered in researching this book that really surprised me, and I think is a game changer in the way we think about what beavers can do, is that beavers will build a pond, and there's a basin of water we can see. But that's just the water we can see. A beaver pond stores at least three times as much water underneath it. So 
that means that when you start doing the math and you think that every beaver pond has three, to three or four times as much water underneath it in a giant sponge, if you will, that's a lot of water. So if you look at that succession of dams going down that creek and you think each of those little ponds is a, is a got an invisible body of water in the land, you can start to understand why people are getting excited about having beavers in the watershed for watershed resiliency. So in Milwaukee, for example, in 2021, the Municipal Sewage Department did a study where they identified that if they put 60 colonies of beavers in the upper watershed of the Milwaukee River within 25 years, and this is, these are sophisticated science modeling went into this study at the University of Wisconsin, they would be storing 1.7 trillion gallons of water a year. That's water storage valued at $3 billion. And Milwaukee is a city that is really concerned about flooding, as is you know, just about every city across the United States. We're not gonna move our infrastructure. Um, in the Chesapeake, another project I write about, they're using beavers to cleanse the water going into the Chesapeake, because those giant sponges that we can't see underneath beaver wetlands and ponds, we might think of them as giant coffee filters as well as sponges. So water sinks down and is cleansed of nitrogen, and phosphorus, and sediment, and a lot of other pollutants. And study after study in the last 10 years has been coming forward with very significant numbers. Um, so in the Chesapeake, which is really um, concerned about pollution, they're harnessing beavers. Um, so let's go to the next slide. I, I had so much fun reporting and researching this book because I met incredible people, some of them in the past. And one of the people I met in the past was Lewis Henry Morgan, who became quite famous for his fascination with beaver dams in the 18, late 1800, mid 1800s, really. So he wrote a book called The American Beaver, published in 1868. And this is the map from it right here. And this is a plate from the book. So Morgan actually documented some of the last remnants of beaver land in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, he was a railroad man, and he was out there helping build the railroads that would then mine the ore around the Great Lakes. But he was a trout fisherman, and when he was fishing for trout, he saw these incredible beaver constructions, and they just stopped him in his tracks, and he started documenting beavers. Um, and I would go out and actually take this map and find some of these beaver dams, which meant that 200 years later, they had prevailed. So that's quite significant. That's A beaver lives about 12 years in the wild. That means successive generations of beavers have been maintaining these things. Again, we don't know how they do this. We don't understand enough about them. See the next slide. So another, another person who I encountered and I wanted to share with you is Dorothy Richards. In contrast to Morgan, who became quite famous, she would be quite forgotten by history. She was a self-trained uh, naturalist who wrote a book about beavers called Beaver Sprite. Um, and she would go on to not only study beavers throughout her life and live in a tiny um, farmhouse in the Adirondacks with up to 40 beavers at one time. Um, yeah, seriously. Um, but she actually, in her book, made some observations and insights about beavers that are now being supported by science, uh, by new uh, kind of research in animal behavior, and also, interestingly, uh, by wildlife rehabilitation people putting their stories of beavers on social media. So one of them is Nibby, right here, who is in Chelmsford, Massachusetts. And she's been quite a social media sensation because she's absolutely adorable. But also, she was um, obsessed with little rubber balls. And she didn't want to have anything to do with sticks, to the extent that people were worried that she would never grow up to be a beaver. <laughs> and then at a year and a half, and she was always kind of playing tricks on her handler. And then at a year and a half, she got serious about building dams, but what was really interesting is that sticks were one place, toys were another. And um, so she was actually demonstrating the things that Dorothy Richards had observed, but were discounted in Dorothy Richards' time. 
which is that beavers have a lot more intentionality than just the instinct to grab it, bite it, drop it, which is what people thought. So when people tried to put her toys on the dam, she'd get really upset. There's videos of her, it's very funny. Um, but I wanted to just take you back to 1938, when Dorothy Richards discovers her love for beavers and read for you a little bit of that encounter, because it's quite wonderful. Um, it's just a short section from the book. So this is Dorothy Richards. She and her husband buy a house. They live in Little Falls in the Adirondacks in New York, and they buy a house at the confluence of two creeks because she is very poorly. She has a, a lung disease. For the next two years, Dorothy went to work at their stationery store and spent all the evenings she could taking carrots and apples to the beavers and sitting with them. They had discovered there were some beavers. She had discovered there were some beavers living in a in the creek behind her house. In her memoir, she mentions that she had struck a deal with Al, her husband. She would play cards with him once a week in Little Falls, but in return, he would help her with the beavers. And she recounts the way Delilah, in particular, formed a bond with her, often bringing her the new kits, each spring to show them off. My favorite photograph of her from this time shows her sitting on the banks of the pond with a row of beavers lined up along her outstretched legs. This is her, by the way, with her favorite beaver, Eager, having tea. I think she set it up for the camera, but I'm not sure. The beavers sit on their haunches like a row of pet Pekingese, each of them clearly so pleased with where they are and with a bite of apple grasped in their front paws. And Dorothy looks right into the camera and beams. In another photograph, she sits in the flat bottom boat she used to explore the pond her companion, a curious beaver, who's come along and is peering over one side. Looking at the many photographs of Dorothy with the beavers surrounding her, it's hard to remember that they were wild animals she had befriended. Then one early March day, Dorothy and Al were braving the winds to visit the beaver pond when a dramatic event happened. As soon as they reached the pond, they saw that the top of the beaver lodge had been caved in and when they looked, water was surging around the lodge. They saw what looked like a piece of driftwood. The wood kept breaking the surface in the same place and disappearing, only to surge back up again. Then they realized what the flotsam was. That bit of brown wood was a beaver's nose. One of the beavers was being held by something from below, swimming up only just to get its nose through the water and take a breath before it was pulled back down. Without hesitating, Al took off his coat and plunged into the current. Soon the water was swirling around his hips and his chest. Near the beaver, he plunged his arms down and heaved up a log to which a steel trap was attached. And in the trap was a beaver. Al managed to get both the beaver still attached to the log and the trap to shore. They recognized the beaver. It was Delilah. As soon as Al released the trap, she fell over unconscious. Al still had to get her across the creek. Taking the 50-pound beaver in his arms, he waded into the swirling water, and at one point it was completely over his head. Dorothy remembers screaming, go back, go back, because Al could not swim. Somehow, Al found his footing and made it to shore. Dorothy wrapped the beaver in Al's coat, and he rushed her back to the house. Dorothy searched for other traps and hid them in the bushes. She recounts that she waited by the pond with, quote, murder in my heart. That night, they wrapped Delilah in wool blankets and put her in an unused upstairs bedroom. And exhausted, they went to sleep, hoping, hoping, she would make it through the night. About midnight, Dorothy woke to hear banging and clattering and a crash. When she opened the door, she saw the beaver busy moving furniture. <laughs> <laughs> the beaver had chewed the legs off a mahogany dresser, which had crashed over, and she was working on the desk. 
To keep an eye on the beaver and prevent more damage, Dorothy slipped into the guest bed in the room. Before she knew it, Delilah had waddled over to the bed, climbed on a nearby box, and was staring right at her. She looked deep into my eyes, wrote Dorothy, which were right on a level with hers where I lay. But her expression and her manner were so gentle, I lost all my apprehension. Not content to just look at Dorothy, Delilah soon decided to climb up on the bed and sit on Dorothy's chest. <laughs> According to Dorothy, the beaver then explored the room. She crawled under the bed and finding the steel springs, pushed on them so that Dorothy <laughs> rose up and down as if on a trampoline all night long. The beaver then found a new water pump lying on the ground ready for installation and began giving the pulley a push to see the, wheel, the wheels start twirling around. She busied herself this way all night, dragging rugs and shoving chairs, generally rearranging the furniture in the room. I just love this story. I don't even care if it's true. <laughs> I think it was, because Dorothy was quite a, quite a stickler. Only then, Delilah's desire to modify her environment satisfied, did the beaver climb back up on the bed and curl up next to Dorothy so that she and Dorothy lay back to back and slept. I think it was the trapping of Lila that motivated me to devote the rest of my life to beavers, wrote Dorothy. The next year, she wrote, by the time November ice closed in, I had been led step by step into a life I had never dreamed of. So um, I think Dorothy Richard really was quite something. Um, but we have to leave Dorothy because there's a little more to our story, and you can read about her in Beaver Sprite. Um, let's go to the next, oh, we're here already, thank you. <laughs> so, okay, so we do need to switch gears because um, Dorothy Richards was one of our first Beaver believers, but we can't leave without talking about the way history has treated the Beaver. And before I explain the images in this slide, I actually want to read you another short section from the book which I also had a great time researching and writing. Um, not least of which because it was set here in Oregon, and I came back to Oregon to um, research it and write it. Uh, literally wrote it in Yahas, thanks to the generosity of some friends. Um, and it, it uh, tells the story of, um, well, you'll, you'll hear. This is called Looking for Aster in Astoria. waters of the Atlantic during the fierce winter of 1783. Just off the coast of England or close to the Chesapeake Bay, we don't know exactly where, several first-class passengers on the American vessel the Carolina paced the deck. They were officers of great and powerful trade organization, the governor and company of adventurers of England trading into Hudson's Bay. They had come above to speak in private about weighty matters, matters of great importance, concerning a particular trade item that had already made them fabulously wealthy. Little did they know that a passenger, a young man who had paid five guineas for a bunk in steerage, had also ventured to the upper deck and was listening. The money to be made was so fantastic that at first the young man thought they must be talking about speculation in tulips, but even a butcher's boy knew the follies of tulip mania that had bankrupted 17th century Amsterdam. No, the men were talking about something of great practical value that sold for such staggeringly high prices in London, it made his head spin. They were talking about beaver. The men discussed methods of bailing and sorting and transporting furs. What the young man overheard next made him tremble. Beaver skins sold in London for 20 shillings a pound, and a prime beaver pelt weighing two pounds could be traded for trinkets and knickknacks worth no more than two or three shillings. Fur could be traded for iron kettles and hatchets, English 
blankets, guns, rock gut gum, but also sometimes for just a handful of cheap jewelry, blue glass beads, ribbons, pins, even a packet of sugar buns. Hunched down against the wind, the young man did the math. Four shillings for a pelt was 40, was worth to 40, was a huge gain, even with the cost of transportation. He had paid the equivalent of 25 US dollars for his passage, and it had taken him four years of hard work in London to save up enough money. He had so little money to spare, he had wrapped the flutes in his one suit and his extra shirts and underwear in another to avoid paying the extra charge for freight. As soon as he arrived, he made his way to New York City, found work peddling bread, and as soon as he could, sold the seven flutes and used that money along with cunning, self-confidence, stamina, and ambition to buy pelts of beaver, then other furs. In an almost unbelievably short time, he was rich. Within 15 years after landing in New York City, Johann Jacob Astor was America's first multimillionaire. So I just want to flash forward. So I travel out to Astoria in search of remnants of Astor's legacy there, because what Astor would do was um, convince the young President Jefferson to let him fund an expedition um, so that he could claim all the trading ports along the way and then found the first settlement west of the Mississippi, which would be Astoria, named, of course, after himself. On the wall of the Historical Society of Astoria, Oregon, is a map of Astor's westward expeditions. It's right over there. Next to the map are two glass cases, one holding a gentleman's worn black top hat made of beaver felt, and the other an equally aged stuffed beaver on a base. I should stop for a minute and say, when I started work on this book, I had no idea what a beaver felt hat was. I, I imagined something like Daniel Boone wore, but that was actually a raccoon hat. Yeah. Um, beaver hats, you need to imagine what George Washington wore, the tricorn hat, or Mr. Darcy on Bond Street. Um, everybody needed a beaver felt hat, because in the 1500s, they discovered that beaver fur, which has barbs, makes the most durable felt. Um, still, the, to this day, it is desired by the best pool table companies, um, <laughs> but it's hard to get. So um, in short order, Europe went through all their beavers. So when beaver were discovered here, it was really, really um, a valuable item. It was, think of it as the vortex of its day. And everybody needed a hat for warmth. The beaver whose fur, this is the stuffed beaver in Astoria, had turned a light brown with age, nevertheless looks busy in the act of gnawing on a stick Peering down at these two objects from his portrait on the wall is Astor, who capitalized on the European hat industry's need for beaver felt. Despite the desultory air of neglect, the choice of objects is apt. The hat, the beaver, the map, and the man were like the four legs of the table on which stood the economic history of young America. And there's John Jacob Astor. So when the first explorers came and set up the big trading companies, the currency of this country was literally beaver. Um, and beaver tokens were what people traded. So these are beaver dollars. Um, and they equal uh, a certain number of pelts. In the portrait, Astor is simply dressed in a black suit with a white cravat. He has a slightly disheveled look as if he'd finished a long day of work and beneath his dark, his eyes, dark circles tinge his face, giving it a worn, almost tired look. His rather portly belly indicates his success in the world and the painter has taken care to depict his jacket is slightly pulled apart to accommodate his girth, <laughs> revealing a triangle of white shirt. Astor looks out with an expression of satisfaction the gaze slightly weary but still intense, 
It is the look of someone who has achieved his life's goal. By the time the portrait was completed, Astor had already made a bundle trading beaver pelts in the East, but he was planning to build a financial empire by extending that trade West. No doubt, he was thinking about his fortune. And just because um, I want to move on, and we got a little bit of a state line, late start, I just want to read the conclusion of that chapter because what would happen, of course, is that Astor would found Astoria, he would set up American Fur Company, and they would, mountain men would set to work with steel traps, trapping beaver, and in a very short time the beaver would be gone. So um, he didn't care because he had this global trading empire set up and he would trade other things. This is the way the chapter closes. I head out of Astoria, following the twisting road toward Portland, driving in the dark. In the car lights, I see a glow of eyes. They are low to the ground and still. Coyote, I wonder. Then my heart leaps. It could be beaver. All along the way, I have been following a river, then a wide wetland, a swamp, beaver habitat. I slow the car down and peer into the darkness. There's a wild animal in the side of the road. On the postcard of the Columbia River that I had sent to my mother, I had written, looking for Astor in Astoria, no beavers yet. I knew she'd get the humor. I stop the car and wait, I listen. There's a rustle in the grass, but it's not the beaver hoping to see. Staring back at me are the wide, startled eyes of an elk. The conversion of natural resources into power has always been the propelling force of empire. Africa had gold and ivory, Asia spices, salt and silk. The Atlantic Ocean rippled with cod. From the beginning of the 17th century onward, America had the beaver. Throughout the colonial period, beaver pelts instead of gold were the unit of trade. But natural resources like beavers are never infinite. And if you take too much and do not let those resources replenish, there is only one outcome, they run out. So the result of the empires that were made on the back of the beaver is that we almost wiped the beaver out to the next slide. Um, geomorphologists and river scientists now refer to the period of 1600 to 1900 without blinking an eye as the Great Drying, in large part because beavers were removed from the landscape. Other things were going on, but without these first river keepers, the river systems really became highly degraded everywhere, and our wetlands dried up. We had lost a phenomenal number of wetlands to development, but also just due to in many wild places where we could have beavers, we lost them. But luckily, as I said before, beavers are back. They need a rebrand, they need our help, <laughs> but they're back. You know, we thought about them as commodities and as pests for too long, and now we really need to think about them as the water kind of superheroes that they are. No one has put a value on biodiversity yet, but when they do, the value that beavers bring is going to be staggering. So science, again, has shown what I should say the indigenous peoples of this continent have known um, since the beginning, because I begin beaver land with the story of the great beaver in the Algonquian tradition where I live, but I talk about great beaver stories throughout the continent because they're different in different areas. But the indigenous peoples understood their role in preserving the water, preserving the ecology. And we are now waking up to that with science. So 30% increase in animal species across the board in beaver wetlands and beaver ponds. The water itself holds 15 times more plankton and microbial life. Once we study it, we see the um, tremendous gains. So I just want to go to a, another slide. We really should think about beavers as a North American climate action plan you know, that we can be harness, harnessing. But I should say, you know, beavers are already doing it. Wherever there are beavers, they're not waiting for us. They're just repairing 
the river system. It's just incredible. Um, I call this slide Beaverland. This is a burn scar in Colorado. So this is after a wildfire has come through and decimated um, everything. You can see it in the background. Um, and beavers were here, they survived, they preserved an oasis of green, and, and the rebound is, is remarkable. So I want to close, but just very quickly before I do, I wanted to show you some images of the beaver pond where you saw the dam. All right, so maybe we could just go to the end. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned that I was watching beavers pond near where I live again. So the beavers I describe in Beaverland. This book begins in the beaver pond right near my house. And I don't want to spoil the story of what happens to them and how I find them again. But literally, this book came out December 6th. And when it came back from the book launch, I went to check on the beavers and I discovered that their dam had been breached. I was really devastated. The pond went down two feet because we had no snow and it was strangely warm. And because the pond emptied, the beavers were in a perilous situation. They, they have to get in and out of their lodge underwater and they couldn't. So they had fled, they were gone. Um, I searched for them and I found them actually downstream because we had no snow, because it was warm. It was this kind of dark fairy tale of climate change. They took advantage of the situation and they started ponding. In winter, when there's usually no food, in winter they're supposed to be in torpor, just living off the fat sword in their tail. But they managed to take down four birch trees, build that dam, and build this pond. Um, so, on January 20th, it was three feet high. March 25th, it was five feet high. And it is still growing. Um, it's now Dr. Berkstead, who I write about in the book, the geomorphologist I tromp around with um, in the White Mountains, is so excited about it. She's coming down, Yukon is studying this site. Because people have not seen beavers do this at this time of year. They should be under the ice sleeping. But they didn't wait, they just went for it. So in some way, it's really kind of interesting what's happening there. But if we go to the next slide. So this is just one of the native birch trees they took down. They lived off the underlying bark. Um, they can survive off the cambium if they have to, but it, it, it offers very little nutri nutrition. So the question is, who was doing this? Um, and I set up wildlife cameras and I finally found them. <laughs> there they are. Two little beavers. I think from the lodge only two survived. Uh, we think they're two-year-old yearlings, so we're not sure if they're a mated pair or not. One's definitely a female, they may be siblings, but let's go out and show you some images. They're really amazing. So there they are. Um, let's just keep going. There's, um, that's where I, one of them has a notch in its tail, so uh, that's a female. Um, and by behavior, I've been sending images to Dr. Glennis Hidd in Canada. She's one of the only beaver mammologists, and she, she said for sure, through the behavior patterns, it's a female. Let's go to the end. Finally, there's been um, video, got all this video of them eating. Let's go to the next one. Finally, on the 13th of March at 516, she was confident enough to come out during daylight. So that was a good sign. And now I have a lot of footage of them in the daylight. But what's really exciting is the next slide. Wow. They're building a lodge. So this is a lodge. Um, being it, being built from the ground up. What they will do is, the, in the middle of that pond, there is a, a thin line of water that normally is not visible. Um, so the beavers flooded it, but they know that the flow is going this way. If there's a massive storm or something, the water's gonna go like this. So they put a, a stick counter flow so that if there was a flood event, their lodge won't get wet, you know, washed away. Pretty smart, right? And now they're building on the upstream side of it, right? So that that, that law will be um, holding in place if there was a storm event. So again, we don't know how they know how to do this, but they, they do. And this will be the base of the lodge. They're now starting to pack it with mud, and I've got a lot of footage of them there at night. It's just, it's growing out. And then it will become the iconic teepee. But this also means that they're intending to flood the water up about 10 feet, because I want to be surrounded by water. And sure enough, I looked up in the woods, and they're starting to gnaw off the trees about 10 feet up. So they have a plan. 
Gee, they got it all mapped out. Um, so just finally, I want to say, you know, I, I fell for Beavers. I'm not the first. Dorothy Richards and others came before me. But I didn't just fall for Beavers. I think I really fell for the story of Beavers in our time because they're so ordinary, they're extraordinary. And I found them in my backyard. And they are such a story of hope in our dark time of climate change. And I tell myself, you know, if the natural world can do this, and there's this climate change solution that we've overlooked for so long, what else might there be that we just haven't observed yet? Because we, because we haven't known to look. And I think we're just learning to look at the natural world in a more respectful new way for the kind of lessons it can teach us. Because we're gonna need all the resiliency we can get. We need technology, yes, but that's not gonna save us completely. So thank you very much. the actual dam. <clears throat> I noticed um, you had a picture of the Colorado wildfire in the Wood River in Idaho, Ketchum. Um, they put in beaver analogs. And I think, I'm not sure in your book if you had that picture of the same issue of the wildfire going through and those, and that Wood River was very, retained its moisture and was very lush. So what's the difference between an analog and the actual dam? Oh, well, that's a really good question. So in the Chesapeake, for example, <laughs> They're, they're putting, they call them BDAs, beaver dam analogs. And um, in the Chesapeake, they're putting in beaver dam analogs because the motto is, if you build it, they will come. But the idea is to create habitat, put in the beaver dam analogs to slow the water down, um, get, it, uh, get enough water vegetation, aquatic vegetation growing that beavers can come there, plant willow, fast growing willow, and poplar, and things that beavers can eat. And then they're hoping that beavers will naturally go there. In the east, you cannot translocate beaver or relocate them. Out here in the west, you can, so they have that great advantage. So BDAs are a great start, but not only do beavers manage the you know, dam sites, if there are beavers in there, but also you, you don't get the biodiversity with BDA. Mm -hmm. you, you do slow the water down, and you do get the benefit of it sinking down, but you don't get the biodiversity. And also, you know, if something happens, beavers will get right out there and rebuild it for free. You're right there. <laughs> you know, that's their job. They're 24-7 they're maintaining that dam or modifying it. 
So they're watching the river all the time, and the river is always shifting. And you know, rivers want to move uh, with the weather, with everything else, with a storm surge. So the BDA doesn't do that. The BDA just stops the water once. So I think they're a great start, and they've been used to create uh, beaver habitat in Central Oregon quite a bit. Mm -hmm. We haven't even talked about fish. Um, there's a motto: Beaver taught salmon how to jump. So. Um, one of the myths of beaver damming complexes is that they're not good for fish. It's been the excuse for taking beavers out because they warm the water and they're cold-blooded, you know, salmonids need cold, rushing water, so do trout. But actually, I don't want to go into the geology here, but beaver damming complexes actually cool the water downstream. It's just in certain areas that they warm it. And they create these big pockets of refugia for young fish and grow. So everywhere that they've studied it, salmon populations are exploding with beaver damming complexes. So the real question is, where did the idea start that beavers were bad for fish? I think it might have been some fisherman who was pissed off that his favorite <laughs> beaver fishing site got flooded out or something. Because I mean, it's a little more complicated than that, but it really, um, there's been a lot of misinformation throughout the country about it. Yeah, I mean, that trout and wood is quite active now, and trying to get the reintroduction of beaver. Yeah. You know, you know they understand that there is a, a, yeah. a really good connection. And, and ducks unlimited as yeah. well. Because um, sure enough, out east, where duck hunting licenses are big money, um, beaver ponds bring migrating waterfowl. Sorry, you had a question. On average, how many um, beaver live in a dam, like a colony or a family or what have you? Uh, you know, that's a really good question. One lodge will inhabit one pond. Um, beavers seem to be very pacific and not aggressive, except they need to maintain their territory because they know there's only so much food. So they won't tolerate another beaver family in the same um, pond unless it's really, really big. Yeah. I mean, they're big, big um, lakes, big, big ponds out in uh, Michigan and Wisconsin where you have multiple lodges, multiple families. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, those are actually kin. Um, and what I've been reading about and learning is that often uh, one beaver family will have lodges they rotate through. So they'll have a family of kids in one lodge. They'll let it lie for a season, and they'll move to another lodge to get rid of parasites. So they do their own kind of mite control. So is just one family in a lodge? One family in one TB, but in one pond tends to be one. And how many kits is, it, is a typical litter, whatever you call it? Two to four. But often the um, yearlings, they'll stay for two years. Traditionally, the two-year-olds go out, but sometimes the two-year-olds come back. We don't know why. They didn't like it out there. <laughs> they got divorced. I don't know. <laughs> they lost their mate. But, but they are accepted back, and it's interesting. They um, So often we find lodges where those two-year-olds actually become like babysitters, and they take care of their siblings. Um, so if they're kin, they're not rejected. So sometimes there are lodges with as many as eight beavers, and it turns out they're the two-year-old uh, um, yearlings. But again, genetic testing on beavers hasn't been done the way it's been done on wolves and bobcats and other animals. It just, it's just a little, little bit of study done. It'll be interesting what we what we find out. And are kids going to respond? In theory, hopefully. But a lot of things will, um, kid, kids don't necessarily survive. I mean, they're little, they're really, Google a baby beaver if you want to see the most adorable thing <laughs> ever. It's just a miniature beaver. wrong time, 
And then, because we didn't have snowpack and we didn't have ice, we just washed it out. But when I found what had happened, I actually reached out to him and I just talked to him and I actually gave him a copy of Beaverland because it had just come out. And I thanked him for all these years of letting me walk his land. And, um, you know, I didn't, didn't say much, I just said, Did you read it? And uh, he read it and he said, Oh my gosh, I, he called me up. He said, I didn't mean to kill the beavers. So I connected him with a grant operation, an outfit, and he's going to get a grant to put in a pond level. And you can manage the water in a beaver pond if you feel, fear it's going to flood. They basically put a pipe through the dam, it's like a permanent leak. Beavers get used to it because they're used to water going up and down in years of drought. As long as it doesn't go down more than 24 inches and they can go get in and out of their lodge, they're fine. So he's going to get a pond leveler in the spring. So it's kind of, I think, a great story of how um, beavers can adapt and humans can learn. You know, we can learn if we have the right information. Oh. I guess, oh, let's do one more. Okay. Can you tell me more about how much they eat, what they eat, and about the tail? Yeah. Well. Um, all the statistics about them eating that I researched so lovingly are in the book are sort of, I fear I'll get them wrong if I try to replicate them right here because they tend to be a little bit specific to times in here, but they eat a lot because they're herbivores and they get very little nutrition from plant matter. In fact, they have a really weird digestive system. They're like cows. They digest it twice because there's not much nutrition in grass and ferns, water lilies, all the kind of duckweed and things they eat. Like horses and cows, they just have to eat constantly, right? Your horse is just grazing, 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 so is your cow. Beavers are a lot like that. They also can get some nutrition from the cambium, the underlying layer of a tree, or um, you know, a sapling of branches. Um, and then, what was your other question? Yeah, about a little bit more about the tail. The tail. So they live, they store fat in the tail for the winter, and they live off that because they don't hibernate. They go into something called torpor, which is a massive slowing down. Mm -hmm. They still come out to breathe, um, and they will feed off. They make a kind of haystack under the water of twigs and branches. Maybe some of you have seen it. And they will nibble that during the winter very slowly. They'll swim out in you know, freezing cold water. Um, and the tail has those indentations that I talked about where it looks like it's kind of like, kind of almost like scales, even though it's soft, because that increases the surface area for all those blood vessels. It has an extraordinary number of blood vessels in it. The early explorers loved to eat it because it's a source of fat. And in fact, the Catholic Church, which deemed beavers a fish, on Fridays, it was considered. It was considered any Catholics here. You could have fever on Friday. They, um, it was a coveted delicacy because of the tail and this. You know, people would roast the fat. Um, but you can imagine if you're in the woods and you're eating a lean diet of game, that fat would have been life saving for people. So it was also considered an aphrodisiac. It's kind of confusing because you eat fish as a kind of like penance, I thought, but anyway. <laughs> okay, it was a good kind of double duty in the medieval world of Europe. I guess we should continue our conversation over book signing. Thank you so Thank much. You.